Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast, episode number 62. Heartland bow hunter with Michael Hunsucker, Sean Luchtel, and completely unexpected guest, Nate Flynn. Why did the buck cross the road? We'll tell you later in this episode. Stay tuned. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hello, Big Buck Registry fans. This is Allison roberts Elman from Go Girl Cosmetics and Scent Elimination Products. It's about 4.45 a.m. Saturday morning, and I'm gearing up for a big hunt today. I've got my Go Girl makeup on. The bow is in the truck, and I'm waiting for this week's Big Buck podcast to come out. I learn a little something every week that I listen to the show. This is Allison Roberts Onion, and you're listening to Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Hi, this is Joel Maxfield from Matthews, Inc., and you're listening to my favorite podcast on the Internet, the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. This is Dusty Clark from Daybreak Outdoors, Makers of Infraction Mineral www.daybreakoutdoors.com and you're listening to my favorite hunting podcast ever the big buck registry big buck podcast welcome to the show everybody this is jay scott your host of the big buck registry thank you for joining us once again and i am also joined on the other side on the other line from ohio dusty phillips dusty what's going on man Yo, yo, yo. Not a whole lot here in Ohio. You know, the weather is kind of cooler, and I'm really starting to think about hunting a lot. Yeah, it's it's on the brain. Got hunting on the brain. 53 degrees this morning. I walked outside, and I was like, man, I should have my hunting riggings on right now. Mm. What's going on with you, Jay, in New Hampshire? Same thing, man. I'm just seeing deer. I'm seeing young turkeys still walking around. I'm thinking about my bow a lot. Yeah. That, that was a stud you texted me earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're rubbing it in my face. <laughs> Just it was a giant. It was a giant, you know. It was not a giant. But it was. It was probably about a 12-inch spike, you know. That's a stud. It's not a 12-inch spike. No. Oh. Just a little little guy roaming around, being stupid. Um, actually, my neighbor saw that buck and another buck on his lawn last night, and then I caught this deer um, about a, a quarter mile down the road, just standing next to a covered bridge in the brows there, just kind of chewing on stuff. And I was able to drive right up to him, took some pictures, and he didn't really care. 12, it's crazy. 12, 12 noon. It's crazy. Yeah. I, you know, we were probably got within five yards. Yeah, I, I thought that maybe you had it on a leash or something tied up in the backyard. Well, that's what it looked like, didn't it? It looked like it was my pet. Like I was, went I was thinking, I was thinking that. Well, someday. I was like, I was like, man, I'm kind of jealous. He's got deer tied up in the backyard. Right. That's funny. Yeah, he was. Uh, he's just been hanging around a little bit around here, I guess. But he had no no fears and anything. So I don't know if that's good or bad or what that means. But he wasn't a shooter. I don't think. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, you know, for a beginner hunter, maybe. Yeah, I'd get a kid. I'd let a kid. Yeah, yeah, sure. absolutely. You yeah. know, a trophy's a trophy in a kid's eyes. It doesn't matter if it's got antlers, a slick head. It doesn't matter, you know. And we're not all about monster bucks. You know, shooting a good one's nice, but it's more like meat in the freezer for us. Right. But that, I don't know if you looked at it a little closer, it looked like it had the potential to start growing a decent rack, you know, maybe in the yeah, next it, few years. It wasn't just going to be a straight spike. Yeah, I'm going to call him Skyscraper because then things are going straight up. Yeah, they're going to go nice and tall. They're going to be a nice tall buck. No question about it. So that's pretty cool. Um, what's going on at Hunt Neck? You know, uh, Hunt Neck's getting crazy. He, he's he's having fun. You know, Dusty Hunt Neck, check it out on Facebook. But, uh, you know, it, it boils down to a lot of things, a lot of sayings, a lot of slang that the hunter would either take a picture of, he would talk about, he would say. You know, I, I just posted one that says, if your girl skins her own bucks, you might be a Hunt Neck. Right. You know, that that's uh, just some sayings and just some cutting up a different side of me that uh not everybody knows but they're gonna see it right it's, it's your uncensored self really yeah it, it really is you know it's it's actually me being me and there's no you know it's not false information it's it's actually real stuff that i actually say right. and do right because yeah i mean you're you kind of we've hung out before side by side and 
Don't tell all my stories now, Jay. I'm not telling all your stories, but you do loosen up a little bit more than you do on this show. But we're trying to keep this to a family kind of show so that everybody can listen. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, it, and I, I like to cut up. I'll, yeah. I'll, admit, I'll admit to it. I'm the first one to, to cut up with anybody. And, you know, that, that's the real me. And I'm not holding nothing back here, but it's cleaner. And, and I, I kind of reserve myself on the podcast. And that's okay. That's, you know. But then again, I kind of bring myself out sometimes. You may see it here and there. Right. Would you ever consider doing a Hunt Neck podcast where you actually get to the explicit rating? You know, the sky's the limit with anything. and That's where I'm going to leave at because you just never know. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, but I do see that in your future. I think I could play the straight man, as I always do. And right. You could play the goofy guy. Yeah, we we could probably work that out, you know. Uh, you know, you just never know. You never know what's going to happen. All right. Well, if you need help, you let me know. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, man. Um, well, who do we have on the show today, Dusty? Somebody good. You know, somebody really uh, good. Yeah, if you're an outdoor channel follower, you know, you've heard of Heartland Bowhunter. Who, who hasn't? They're uh Great, great, great camera work. It's phenomenal. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to dig into that and, and see how they get the great footage that they get. I would yeah, like on. to know more about that. And I'm psyched that they're on the show so we can learn more about that. They have, you know, they have a very cool website, heartlandbowhunter.com. Great um, logo. And it's like season six is coming out. So this they're, they're no rookies. They've been doing this a while. Yeah, you know, and, and uh, Allison and Ann said that they was great people and give them a good, good. Uh, they they hollered at us and or she contacted me and, and and recommended that we get in touch with them and you know thanks Allison for that and uh, we're going to get them on the phone. Nice. So Allison Roberts O'Nan kind of set this thing up. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's correct. You know, and uh, she shouted out to Sean and and got in contact with me and and asked me if it was okay to contact and i said absolutely you know nice. we we like to hear that uh good people and you know be great content for our show right allison's the best isn't she oh absolutely you know and, and like i said shout out to allison for what you do for us you know and and uh thanks for what you've done and we appreciate it definitely well let's uh let's not hold off anymore let's get sean and michael on the phone let's do it sean and michael welcome to the big buck registry's big buck podcast how are you Doing good. Thanks for having us. Oh, we're yeah, psyched. It's like to have you on, man. This is uh, it's always a pleasure to have somebody that's uh, getting it done in the outdoors, and uh, we we pride ourselves on having f- tremendous guests, and you guys fit the mold for sure. Thanks very much. We really, really appreciate you guys having us on here. No problem. So, w- tell us where you guys are at right now. We're Mike, you want to tell them where you're at right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're we're in Missouri. Uh, Sean and I live, you know, not too far apart, so. Uh, we're we're gearing up for season, getting ready to kick things off. He's heading to Utah in only a couple short weeks. Oh wow! And uh, and then we're heading to North Dakota right after that. So even though it seems like it's kind of the middle of summer, season's kind of right around the corner. Yeah, it is. It's, yeah. it's right you, there. you didn't you didn't talk to really at though. You, you're on the lake. You're about to. Uh, oh. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I didn't know you were that specific. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm catching a bass a bass tournament right now. And, oh, you're in a bass. Yeah, you uh, on the boat right now, like catching fish as we're talking. Actually, yeah, the second we got on the phone, I just boated about a three-pounder. It was pretty nice. <laughs> nice. <Four pounds. laughs> That's awesome. Nate says, it was, Nate, Nate says it was a four-pounder, four pounder, so I underestimated it. I could, he even edited it for me while I was on the phone talking. That's the best. <laughs> so we've got we got yeah, you're in a bass tournament as we speak on the on the podcast right now. That's fantastic. That's the that's a first on the show. I got to tell you that is a first. <laughs> yes, it is. You guys, are, you guys are my good luck charms, apparently. Oh, cool. Yeah, I hope All so. Right. All right. Uh, so, how'd you guys end up in Missouri? Uh, born, and, born and raised here. Born and raised. Yeah, we and both uh, Mike and I really kind of met in junior high, and then really got to know each other better in high school when we uh, we both figured out that we were hardcore bow hunters and just had a passion for it. So. That was kind of our niche to become becoming friends, and uh, kind of just went from there. Gotcha. Do you do any gun hunting at all, or is it all bow all the time? Uh, we do a little bit, uh, mainly like waterfowl. I guess would be you know we do a little bit of shotgun hunting. If as far as deer hunting, uh, we almost never never pick up a gun. Right. I shoot coons off my porch with a twenty two rifle. That's about it. Though. That's about it. Just, <laughs> just for kicks, right? Just just for a uh, little little off off season fun. Um, they get in the track, man. <laughs> hey, Michael, Michael, if you set the hook on one, you got to tell us, all right? Yeah. All right. I'll keep you guys posted. I'll let you know. Nice. Awesome. So you, you're in Missouri, and you guys met in junior high. Um, what uh, what was junior high and high school like for you guys? Uh, Junior high was, I mean, that was extremely clicky, you know. It's just like you yeah. go from elementary to junior high, you're, it's your step into high school. So right. we didn't really know each other too well then, but in the high school, when we figured out we both, that we both go on it, um, you know, that kind of just strengthened our friendship and 
started hanging out and traveling up north in northern Missouri to bow hunt and stuff like that, especially during rifle season. And we actually did rifle hunt on then, um, so we kind of shared camp a little a little bit back then during rifle season as well. Gotcha. Well, what, what yeah, I mean, I think that's what? how we both kind of got started was, you know, our, our dads are obviously hunters, and, um, you know, my dad, Rex, Sean's dad is a little more serious than my dad. My dad mainly just, just rifle hunted and did the deer camp thing opening weekend in Missouri rifle season, so that's kind of how I got started on it. And I loved it so much. I was like, man, this is awesome. And I was like, I just really want to get into bow hunting. And it seems like bow hunting's picked up popularity a lot over the, you know, last 10 years. It seemed like, you know, when Sean and I were going to school together, that there wasn't really hardly any kids that were serious about it. Right. And so that's how we kind of, like I said, naturally just met and became friends and started hunting together. And, um, you know, we kind of just had to lean on his dad, who was really one of the only other bow hunters that we knew that was pretty serious about it. So. Gotcha. What, uh, what clicks were you in in high school? Sean was a Sean was a punk. He was a he he was a goth. He used to wear black and big baggy jeans and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Jinkos. Yep. I was a gothic bow hunter. Really? The, the <laughs> gothic. No. Just kidding. Just kidding. No. <laughs> so no goth for you. So like, uh, uh, so would you paint your nail, Sean, in black or what? Right. Uh, I actually wore all black and I painted the nail pink. It was kind of. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. It, it nice. was a little bit off thick and, you know, I don't know. It's kind right. of my own thing. Right on. Yeah. I mean, black and pink, you know, what, what better choices for a man? <laughs> there you go. No, uh, Mike, Mike was actually more, more or less like a, he played football, so he was a jock, but, um, uh, I don't know. I, I grew up on out in the country, so I don't know. I, since I wasn't good at sports going into high school, I pretty much just gave up on that and kind of focused on hunting. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So you had one jock and not a jock. Got it. Gotcha. Sean ran cross country. He was running. Ah. Oh, that, was... <laughs> that counts. That counts as a sport. Absolutely. So why do you think the, the, the bow has become so popular in the last 10 or 15 years? The challenge. Um, you know, you can teach somebody to pick up a gun within a few days, I think, and, and, and shoot something or at least accurately hit a target. But I think it takes quite a bit more skill and practice to pick up a bow and be able to sight it in and accurately hit a target. Gotcha. Um, I think it takes a little bit longer than just a couple of days for sure. And that's, that's kind of why we went more towards that direction as far as just bow hunting. Yeah. Why do you think everybody... it seems like, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, it seems like a lot of states are, uh, are starting to, you know, kind of cater to the bow hunters and change their regulations and opening seasons earlier for bow hunting and, um, just making it more desirable to be a bow hunter. It, it does seem like there it's some, there is a, a bigger challenge to it. I think the technology has gotten a lot bigger, and I think they do a lot of great stuff with promoting uh, bow and bow technology for the most part. And I think it just looks cool, to be honest. And once, yeah. you, once you get into it, it's you're like, yeah, this is cool. Not only does it look cool, but it actually is. Yeah, and I think with bow hunting, you, get to, you really, I don't know, I feel like you can – you can study the animal a lot more that you're hunting for because you got to get in close range of right. them and figure them out. And just, like I said, it's just a heck of a lot more of a challenge than, yep. than just gun hunting. Do you think and it's, that makes it that much more rewarding too? I agree. Do you think it's a, a, a there's a little bit more of a, an adrenaline rush getting so close to an animal kind of thing? Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. It's a whole different world. It's night and day. It really is to see something that's off 200 yards versus something that's 20 yards away. That's a big difference. Mm-hmm. Yep. So what uh, what drove you guys into or beyond high school? I mean, you're hunting together, you're having fun. Um, but w- when did this thing kind of stick? When you decided you want to make something out of it? You can answer that, Mike. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I uh, I mean, mainly, you know, we just started filming our hunts in high school just because we thought it was fun and we were sharing it with friends and family. And that's kind of how we got started. And um, we initially went and bought a Gorilla $99 camera arm that was just basically like an easy hanger. It was just terrible. It was you might as well not even have a camera arm. It was so shaky. The footage was terrible. And, um, we kind of looked into options, and there really wasn't any options out there for camera arms. Um, and so Sean's dad actually owns a machine shop, and we thought about we talked about designing and manufacturing our own tree arm. That's, that's what we started doing. Um, and we had talked to some of the people that other people that were in the hunting industry in the TV show side, and they were kind of talking to you know machine shops or people they knew locally and having them make their own tree arms for them, but nobody was manufacturing and selling them. And so that was kind of our we saw that as our opportunity to kind of get our foot in the door in the industry, and then um, we kind of just took it from there. Really, just trying to focus on getting the, the best quality footage that we can that we could, and nobody was really. Nobody really was focusing on, you know, storylines and, and good quality footage and uh, at the time. So that was kind of our, our way to get into the industry. Gotcha. That's very cool. Now, as, as far as some of the hunts you've been on, are there some that stick out more than others? 
I think so. Yeah, absolutely. They're all they're all a little bit different, you know. And we we primarily are hunting whitetails, but we do a lot of stuff out west. And um, I don't know. To me, it's, it's all different, and they all have their different ups and downs and rewards. Gotcha. I was wondering if you could pick like your top two each, and I'd like to have Dusty kind of run through some of those moments right now, kind of a play by play. If you could, could you pick your top two, and then we'll we'll get into the number one or number two first, and we'll get to your number ones. Yeah. Okay. Dusty, take, let's it, start, take it away. Let's start with you, Sean. Um, I would say that my number one hunt that I look forward to every year is mule deer hunting um, in western Nebraska. Um, it's just it's just a huge challenge because you know it's spot and talk, and we're not we're not growing up here in the Midwest. We're not used to that. That's a rarity for us. So going out where it's pretty much wide open, no trees at all. You have to find these mule deer in these sand hills, then wait for them to bed and sneak up on them and make sure the wind's right. That's a that's one of the most ultimate challenges there is, I think, as far as hunting in, in the states. Um, just hunting something just for, just spot and stalk. That's 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 the best. I like it a lot more than tree stand hunting. Um, so I guess if I had to not name a number two, <laughs> it would be early season whitetail. Um, just because we found that we being able to pattern them throughout the summer and going into the season, it's it's a huge tactic of ours, and we we're actually more effective that time than during the rut finding these these deer on their on their patterns to, from boot fed or dead to food i'm sorry they're there um i'm just getting in that transition zone and trying to kill them right awesome it, when you go out west on the spot and stock it, that that's just pretty much uh kind of break that down a little bit that's pretty much uh you start glassing and find a particular buck bedded up and then you go on the actual stock yep we'll typically go in there you know right right before dark and we'll get there at daybreak and find them on their feet still and just follow them and you can you can cut them off while they're on their on their feet feeding and stuff but typically we'll try to wait till they bed and hope they bed in the right spot where you can get to them and uh get in there with the right wind and get a shot off at them right and these bucks you pretty much don't know they're there until you get to where you're hunting at and actually glass and, and find the bucks on their feet so that, yeah you know, we've uh we've ran some trail cameras um and if it's legal to bait, that's actually a huge tactic that we've found, um, just to find out what's in the area, just to, you know, hang a camera there, and they'll eventually find it. I mean, there's no, there's, they're there every few days in front of the camera, at, always at night. They never visit it during the day, um, but it's a good, good tactic just to know what's in the area. We definitely don't, don't hunt around it, but um, it's a great way to find out what's in what's in the area right what's the what's mule, the mule deer range a lot further you know than a, than a whitetail though out there out west they'll cover you know miles and miles at a time no problem going to different hill ranges and bedding in different spots so um it's not like you know if you're you're hunting in the midwest and you're hunting 80 acres and you got a big buck on your trail camera that lives on the property i mean they they're moving you know and the, they're the majority of the time over a couple thousand acres at, the, at minimum so they're just all over the place mm-hmm. yeah it's it's tough to pattern something like that when they got such a big range of land to get on it you know that that terrain out there is pretty much flat and kind of what what kind of gra- is it grassy or tell us a little bit yeah, about the terrain. The grass, it's probably I mean sometimes it could it can, if they had a wet spring it'll grow up actually above your knees, but um, for the most part it's right around knee level and uh, there's just little rollers from from the sand hills. It's not it's not terribly tough terrain out there in Nebraska, but um, I'm right. also going on a hunt in Utah next month. Um, around August fifteenth for uh, for mule deer, and that that terrain is much more harsh. It's it's pretty mountainous. Right for a spot and uh, spot and stalk, is that pretty much same gear that you would wear in a Midwest hunt in the woods? Uh, you still camouflage, you know, use your yeah. scent cover. Yeah, and all yeah, that? yeah, we we uh, we always wear camouflage. Uh, I don't necessarily think that it that the breakup is um, is as much of a big deal because they, I don't know, there's plenty there's plenty of stuff to hide behind and. They'll, you know, the the only time that they typically are going to see you is right right before you shoot them. So I don't right. know. What, I don't, I don't think the breakup is that that big of a deal, other than maybe your face. What uh, what camo are you guys wearing? We wear a real tree. So uh, early season we'll wear wear real tree max one, and then we uh, switch to real tree extra later on during the rut and the Midwest hunting. Awesome. Is there any particular tip that stands out for spot and stalk out west? One one tip that just took you to the next level. Um, good optics, good optics for sure. If you, you can't go out there with a rink and ink pair of binoculars or spotting scopes that, that are just, you know, the lowest level that you can find because you're, <laughs> you're not going to find what you need with those. You're looking miles and miles away, um, and sometimes in low light. So you, the good glass comes into play with that as well. Um, 
I think optics are, are huge for, for out west, and it was something that I didn't realize going into it the very first time. So that really? Was, so it was a tri- yeah. trial trial and error for you then? Yeah, well, and then you show up out there, and all the other guys kind of laugh at you that, that live out there. They're like, what are you... What are you going to find with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's part of it, though. You know, that's that's the great thing about hunting. It, it, there's always something to learn. Absolutely. Every, every day, every adventure you go on in the woods is always, you know, whether you're spotting, stalking, or you, you're sitting in a tree stand in, in the Midwest here, you know, you're up in the pine thickets in New Hampshire. There's always something that happens that's new or unseen or, you know, it's all informational. You know, and that, that's, I think that's what feeds your addiction to hunting. It's always something new. It's something different. Every time you go to the woods, you don't see the same deer, the, the same elk, the same mule deer. It don't matter. There's always something there that's new. Right. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. I think with that mule deer hunt, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is to be patient and to be persistent. It seems like it's finding them is the easiest part of it. So, you I mean, you, you see the deer, they're, they're pretty easy to find, but for you to actually kill them with a bow, I mean, you really, everything kind of has to line up perfect. They got to be in, in one, you know, a really ideal spot for you to sneak up on. The wind's got to be right. They got to be better facing the right way. And so, you know, last year on the, on the hunt where, um, I shot my biggest, my biggest muley ever, you know, we were hunting him for almost a week straight, just waiting to get the right opportunity. And we had close calls with him before, but it was just, he was better with other bucks or wasn't better in an ideal spot. And, um, uh, so you just got to really wait for everything to line up. A lot of patience when it comes to spot and stock, it sounds like. Yeah, for sure. Michael, give us two of your best memorable hunts. Um, You know, I would say my number one is probably going to be uh, that, that buck from last year, and it'll actually be on the show next week. Um, it's a buck called Barbed Wire, and we've hunted out, out there in western Nebraska for several years now. And, you know, I went out for the first the first year and hunted really hard and ended up shooting a good buck. And I'd shot a couple, you know, pretty pretty good bucks, 150, 160-type muleys. And, uh, but they have the capability of, of killing some giants out there. And Sean had actually killed his biggest buck ever. It was like a 186 muley the year before. And so I finally was like, all right, you know, I'm going to hold out and, and really try to get a really big one. And so we spent the majority of the week hunting hunting that buck. And, um, I mean, it got down to the wire. I think it was like, you know, one one day before we had to leave and we finally caught up with them. And um, like I said, we, we had hunted them all week and he was better in a bunch of different spots with a bunch of different bucks. And uh, that last morning we caught him by himself, followed him up the, uh, the sand hills, and he bedded facing into the wind, which is they almost never do with the sun right at our back. And it was the perfect little setup. And uh, it's always tough when you're filming. It's even tougher than, than normal when you're filming. But uh, uh, that was probably my most, most memorable hunt. He was uh, my biggest muley to date. So, and it was a really cool hunt. Let's let's hear what number two is. Um, I probably got to go with um, my biggest my biggest whitetail I shot. That was my first trip to North Dakota, and uh, Nate, who I'm fishing with, has the lodge up there, and it's mainly he uh, guides waterfowl hunters primarily. And Nate and I kind of grew up together um, and hunted together a little bit, and you know he knew I was a bow hunter, and he was like, man, he's like he runs pheasant hunters. He's like, man, I've, we've been jumping some really really nice bucks out of these potholes up here, and you got to come up here on a hunt. And so we've been talking about it for a couple of years, and finally we decided, all right, after like two or three years talking about, it, we finally nailed down some dates and made it happen. And uh, the very first night, very first day at a tree in North Dakota, which there isn't many trees, but I killed the killed the biggest buck of uh, biggest whitetail I've ever killed. It's like a 175 inch whitetail in full velvet. He came into a water hole with like six other bucks and two other shooters and it was it was a pretty pretty incredible hunt yeah that's cool you know it's it's always unique when you can make plans like that and seal the deal while you're there yeah i mean it's pretty pretty amazing they had been running cameras all summer or not all summer but for a couple weeks before we got up there and had a few nice bucks nothing real special um and the day we got there we went and checked this camera where i killed that buck and there was a giant on it we're like all right i'm going there well i killed that 175 and we were all you know freaking out and just assumed it was that big deer we went back and started looking at the pictures and the trail cam pictures that we had was actually a different buck that was actually bigger than the one that i had killed and so there was two giants in that same exact spot and uh it was pretty pretty crazy that that we actually got in there and killed one of them so right what what kind of trail cam what kind of trail cameras you guys using for conics Conics, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They kind of got their start primarily in, in like the security industry, and so they make some really, really high end cameras. And uh, I mean, they're they're awesome. They, uh, you know, we've messed around when we were in high school and didn't have a whole lot of money to spend on trail cameras. We bought some of the cheap ones, and they always seem like you, you know, you go out to check them and they're dead, and or they didn't take any pictures, or that's something that's come a long way in the past few years. The trail cameras and man, those Reconyx cameras, they last forever on battery. They never seem to mess up i mean they're just really really reliable and they're you know they're a little more pricey but you get what you pay for when it comes to trail cameras right on for sure yeah i, I can see that you know it, the trail camera sometimes can make or break a season for you if, if you're not you know local to the to the area that you hunt you know you, you're dependent on it 
Yeah, I mean, when we, you know, back in the day when we stopped before trail cameras, you know, you're just on the stand, just hoping to get lucky, and you don't, you know, it's a lot, a lot less relying on the luck anymore now. I mean, now we know what deer in the area, and there's farms of ours that we don't even hunt certain years because there's nothing, nothing on there that's, you know, worth worth going after. So, um, that's, I mean, that's absolutely changed, changed the way we hunt big time, and is a huge reason for us having more success. I think. Yeah, right on. You know, it's uh, definitely a, a technique that. Or, you know, it's like having a partner in the woods at all times, you know. But uh, we're going to get into something that I'm hearing more and more and more. You guys are obviously on the Outdoor Channel, and some of the footage that you guys put out is phenomenal. You know, we want to get into a little bit of the, you know, the, the tips and tricks of, of good footage and what kind of equipment that you're using. Let's kind of run through some of your gear that you're taking in the woods to catch the awesome footage that you guys got on TV. Uh, we typically... Really, we we run DSLRs pretty much 90, 95% of the time. Um, well, Mike and I run them all the time, but I was kind of speaking for the whole team. But um, we, we run with a, a Canon 5D Mark III quite often, and we can we can shoot awesome footage just like a lot of people can in the industry, but we also pride ourselves in photography with that camera as well. And that's something that I, I really, really enjoy doing is shooting a lot of photography. No, it shows. Uh, everywhere you turn, that there's a comment about how awesome you guys' footage is. Yeah, it's amazing how far the cameras have come to, you know, not only trail cameras, but video cameras. I mean, the, the, everybody can buy an HD camera for, you know, under a thousand bucks now. And, and even some of the, the cheaper DSLRs are, you know, five, four or five hundred bucks and you can shoot some pretty dang good video with them. So that's come a long way and changed, changed the, a lot of the way people, people film and everything. But, you know, a lot of it, as much as it, you know, it is, you need to have a high quality camera. Um, a lot of it's, you know, knowing how to run it and being comfortable with the camera and, and, uh, being able to run manual settings and having an eye for the shots. I mean, that's, that's the main thing. I mean, uh, anybody can run around with an HD camera and the footage is going to look decent, you know, on camera, but it's having an eye for the creative shots and the, the shots that really are appealing to the eye. Yeah. You know, creativity, uh, creativity is, is probably the number one factor in great photography. Would you agree to that? Yeah, for sure. It's all about shot composition. Right. Absolutely. You know, and, uh, it, it shows with you guys. Okay. Jay, what do you, what other questions do you have for him? I want to get into a uh, heartland bow hunter a little bit more, just, um, the TV show. And, uh, when, at what point did you decide that this was going to be the thing you were going to do? Like what year did you decide you wanted to actually launch a TV show? Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember what year it was, but it was back when we were when we got started manufacturing the tree arms, and we were obviously filming with them. And we had a group of guys that were all using the tree arms, and we were going to use you know use all the footage to create a promotional DVD or just to help promote yep. the tree arm. We got so much good stuff that we were like, man, what should we do with this? And we just right. got a website and you know started putting putting the videos online and got looked into the TV thing and. Uh, that was just the route that made the most sense. And obviously, Sean and I, <clears throat> at that time, weren't you know we weren't doing it full time. We were just doing it. It was kind of as a hobby, but it kind of grew from there. I mean, the, the industry's tough, and you got it takes a takes a good amount of time to get established and and uh, to get, you know get sponsors and to meet the right people. And so you know, it took us several years after that to where you know we finally turned it into a full time gig for us. Gotcha. So the you were just kind of taking videos of everything you were doing at that point. Right. Yeah, we were just filming everything and filming all of our hunts, trying to promote the tree arm and, and just for fun, you know, just to share with our friends and family today. Gotcha. So let's talk about your, your crew that you've got on the show. Uh, this is Michael. Obviously, we're talking to Michael right now. We're talking to Sean. What about uh, Skyler? Uh, Skyler was actually introduced um, to us from another high school friend that didn't even hunt at the time. Um, he He went to another college and then contacted us when we were in college and was like, Hey, I've got this friend from Arizona. He lives here in Missouri now and he's obsessed with hunting and he loves to film it as well. And so like you guys, uh, I don't know if my phone's still on here or not. It just beeped about the battery, but, um, yep. he just basically said, uh, he's into filming a lot. I think you guys had kind of connected this guy. So I'd like to introduce you to him. So he introduced Skyler to us and he came and just kind of, uh, kind of filmed us a few times and, it really just went from there. He he, uh, he started hanging out with us more often, and then we we basically put him on the team. And now, heck, he lives like two doors down from Mike, so he's he's considered one of our best friends for sure. Gotcha. All right, how about Clayton Campbell? Uh, Clayton came along. Um, he was just introduced to us through uh, another friend that was a hunter, and he, you know we kind of wanted somebody that was out of state. And Clayton lives out in Kansas. Well, we didn't have anybody really 
that we knew very well that lived out in Kansas and was an avid bow hunter. And he uh, he was filming as well, just with some other buddies. And so he kind of he kind of just worked his way in as well. And then him and Skyler became good friends out of the deal. And now they're they're kind of inseparable and hunt together all the time. Gotcha. All right. How about uh, Ty Easley? Ty actually worked for my dad. Um, was it probably 15 to 20 years ago um, at a laser shop, a laser engraving shop. And he was, he's always been into bow hunting. He was actually more or less a mentor to Mike and I when we were, we were starting to get into bow hunting quite a bit in high school. He kind of, he kind of just got us into it more and was already filming as well. He was, he's probably a huge in- inspiration into just picking up a camera and filming our hunts. So that's kind of where we started going with, with picking up a camera and just, just filming the actual kill and stuff like that. Gotcha. Um, Clay Craft. Clay Craft. Uh, Clay's dad, Brian, uh, worked for Whitetail Properties when we first met him, and we met him just through networking. And I'm trying to think here. We had we had met him since he lived close to the Kansas City area. He was working over in Kansas, and he kind of just introduced himself to us. And we got to talking, and he had been filming Clay's son, and he asked if we'd come film a couple, a couple turkey hunts with them, and we did. And shortly after, he uh, we, we figured out he'd be a great asset to the show because he didn't have anybody young. And it's obviously been a huge success because he's very, very passionate about it, and he, he shows a lot of emotion. Gotcha. And uh, see, Nate Flynn. Yeah, Nate, Nate. Nate's, Nate's who I'm fishing with right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I see. So he's actually on the show tonight. So he's he's actually here. Gotcha. Yeah, he's here. Nice. I can give him my phone. Yeah, we, we, uh, how, um, how's come we haven't how's come we haven't heard fish on yet? Yeah. Uh, well, they just swung and missed. I, I did miss one. I pulled it right out of, out of his mouth and didn't even realize it. I was distracted by you guys. So you might have been my lucky charm at the beginning, but now, <laughs> now I'm blaming you for missing that fish. Gotcha. All right, so uh, Nate's but, uh, with you right now. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Nate and I, uh, his parents were good friends with my best friend's parents in high school. And, uh, so we've been hanging out forever since we were kids. You know, we, we'd go camping together and fishing down, down at the pond. And just, we've kind of been friends for a long time. And, um, you know, he's always been a bow hunter, and he had got that place up in North Dakota. And that first year we were doing the show, we went up there and, and filmed the filmed an episode up there, and Nate uh, ended up buying a camera after that, and has kind of been a part of it ever since. Gotcha. And Trent Siegel. Uh, we also wanted someone else um, in Kansas a few years ago, and basically we had just found him through social networking and you know there's there's quite a bit of hunters on on facebook now that kind of mingle and connect and you can just tell we could just tell right off the bat through his photography that he had an eye for all of it and so i got to talking to him on there and he's only two hours away well we asked him to come up for lunch one day and that's kind of how the relationship started from there and he he started filming mike and i a little bit and so shortly after that we brought him onto the team gotcha and does everybody get along for the most part or is there any any uh friendly rivalries going on i don't i don't get along with claycraft i don't i don't like little kids <laughs> i'm kidding <laughs> nice so we yeah, all if you if you've never we all had a clay, clay's en- what's that clay's energy is unbelievable yeah yeah he, he's a really good good kid he's very very well mannered as well but um we had a meeting last night all the guys and we were all talking about how we were, we're really just like a big family we all get along really really well i honest to god i don't i don't think there's a person that doesn't get along with another one on the entire team so pretty blessed to to have what we have going that's very cool uh, how about the when it comes down to like uh editing you guys doing any of the the footage you do you, you have people that you hire to do that uh go ahead mike um uh, yeah actually sean and i are partners in our production company mammoth so we own uh, mammoth with Another friend of ours that we grew up with, uh, that Sean went to actually elementary school with, and we went to high school with, Trevor Hawkins, um, and he and he is not a hunter at all, but he's a passionate, you know, videographer and editor. Uh, we got him, you know, involved from the very beginning, and um, so he does he does most of our our editing. And you know, we have six or seven guys on us on the team of Mammoth now that all handle different different aspects. But Trevor is kind of the main the main editor of the show. He does all the finish editing and the color grading and. He helps put put the story all together. Gotcha. So you got a guy that's kind of trained in that side of things. I mean, you all sounds like you all kind of participate in it as far as the filming, but there, you actually have a guy that does a lot of the editing for you. 
Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a well-oiled machine at this point. I mean, we all know, you know, what we need to get out in the field. And Sean and I go through and at the end of the season and kind of sit down, look at all our footage and, and look into, you know, what episodes are going to be what. And we kind of put it all together, kind of lay out the story, storyboards and all that stuff. And um, and we have a uh, rough editor, Drew, that goes in and kind of cuts everything down, puts everything in place where it's going to go. And then Trevor sits down and kind of puts it all together. Gotcha. Do you ever, you ever get sick of it? Uh, yeah. No. Sorry, I just was swinging at a fish there. <laughs> um, no, man, it, it it gets to be a grind, you know, during the during the rut and when we're doing it every single day, filming and long days and hunting morning, night, morning, night, morning, night. But it's it's awesome, man. I wouldn't I wouldn't trade it for the world. It seems like it's something I would never get tired of at all, at all, because um, you get to kind of do what you love anyway. But now you get to be on TV, and is this your full time career kind of thing, or are there other things you're doing to supplement? Yeah, no, we're doing it full time. We're do, doing it full time now, and it's funny. People are always just like, "Oh man, like, oh, you, it's so often you hunt for a living," and it's it is, I guess, somewhat true. But there's a lot more to it than that. I mean, Sean and I run the day to day business, um, and then we also are, are involved in mammoth on the production side, like right. I said. So we stay stay plenty busy, and uh, you know, we still we do get to hunt a lot. We're fortunate enough to hunt a lot, but we, uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of days spent in the office as well. Right. It's it's good that you brought up that point because this is a business too. It's not just. I guess that's where my my question kind of came from, is that although it is hunting and fishing and you know the things you love, it's not just that anymore. It's now that and the job of producing all this stuff, which takes a lot of work, quite frankly. Yeah, right? yeah, a lot of pressure. <laughs> a lot of pressure, especially if you got sponsors and you got time frames and deadlines to meet. That's that adds an, a little element. So. That's where my question was coming from. Like when you add in that element of business into the thing that was your play fun for quite a while, does that change things? Yeah, it does, but it's not. It doesn't make it any worse. You know, it makes it a little more serious, but it's still, I can't imagine doing anything else. But you never trade it for anything yeah, else, right? Absolutely not. I, I wouldn't for sure. I mean, it's, it's just a dream come true, and it, it's funny because a lot of people. I mean, we get asked this question all the time. Like, did you, did you ever see yourself doing this? Uh, the answer is no. I wouldn't. I mean, geez, when I was 20 years old, I mean, I'm 28 now. When I was 20 years old, I wouldn't. I would have never thought I would be doing this full time, let alone, you know, making a great career out of it. And it's 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 unbelievable. It is, it is a dream come true for sure. Gotcha. All right. So, what what are some things? And you don't have to tell us everything, obviously. But give us some hints of what's coming up on the the next season. Go ahead, Mike. Um, as far as the rest of the season that's airing right now, yeah, are you talking about our our hunts that we have planned for this fall? Well, the rest of the season that's airing, um, and then where are you planning to go for the this fall? Yeah, so in the rest of the season, um, this this coming Monday will be a new episode, and that's going to be my Deer Meadows episode from last year. Where I killed that big muley barbed wire, um, and then after that, we have uh, we get back to some some uh, Midwest hunts during the rut, Kansas. Uh, Skyler hunting in Kansas, uh, Sean hunting in Missouri, um, myself hunting in Kansas, Clayton in Kansas, Trent in Kansas. So a lot of Kansas hunts coming up, and uh, we end the season with a uh, with a goose episode, which is pretty cool. Not a lot of people have seen us oh, wow. uh, seen geese hunting with bows, but we do it every year, and it's a lot of fun. So that's how we're kind of capping off the season. It'll be interesting to see how that's very how that, cool. How like that episode that. is received. Yeah, we've, oh. done, we've done it in the past, and we get a lot of a lot of interest from it. Gotcha. And how about your plans for this upcoming fall? Where are we going? Uh, I I myself have a have a uh, pretty busy schedule to start off. I leave August 14th, 15th, right around there. And I go to Utah mule deer, then I go to North Dakota whitetails, Colorado mule deer, and then I go to tell Mike in um, New Mexico on an elk hunt. And this will be his his first ever elk hunt. And we're just going on a private ranch, so it seems like it's supposed to be pretty good. Um, and that'll I would say that's going to be one of the biggest highlights of the season there. And then we have Kansas during the rut, and, and this new this new lease that we have has a ton of really good deer on it. So we're pretty excited about that as well. Gotcha. So how much work does it take to to go out and you know find the lease and find the place to hunt? Does it does that take prep work? Do you have to make phone calls, go fly places, and and shake hands and meet people? How does that all play out? Uh, it was the question how how, we, how do we find leases and places? To yeah, hunt? yeah. Like how much work is involved in actually just finding the places and and negotiating? There's a, a lot of work um, and a lot of phone calls and really there's a lot of uh, a lot of like trying to figure people out because there's there's plenty of people that call us and invite us places but you really got to figure out if it's going to be be worth the time because a lot of people just want the friendship which is fine but at the same time 
we need enough we need to go on an effective hunt or we're going to be able to get something so really there's just a ton of networking that goes on phone calls emails um and stuff like that and then we've spent plenty of time traveling to places and looking at land that actually haven't that haven't worked out um just something that's not set up right for us and um we've also been on plenty of hunts that haven't worked out as well where they're just we weren't necessarily told what we or we were told something and they didn't have what they, what they told us was there so oh no gotcha How- and that's what i'm like you you really got to figure figure people out you got to figure out if they're telling the truth on stuff or if they just want you to come hang out with them <laughs> <laughs> how do you determine that what what's the deciding factor how do you decide that references really um that's that's huge, I think. And just finding out, finding other people that know them or that have hunted with them before, um, because there's there's some people that kind of. I mean, I'm not I'm not talking bad about anyone, but there's no. there's some kind of come out of the woodwork and you're like, well, where did this guy come from? Does anybody know him? You know, or what's his story? Or does he really have what he says he has? And so that that's that's the hard part. So it's almost like you're checking references in a sense. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. It's a it's a whole different dynamic that I mean to ensure that you've got what you're hoping to set out for to get on on film. Cause that's yeah, a- and another thing that's kind of hard about our situation is we we typically like to stay away from from outfitters because we don't want to look like we're catered to. So right. really, we're trying to just hunt with friends or people that we've met through other other friends or whatever. So that's also another factor that that makes it a little bit tougher on us is just hunting with friends or friends of friends. <laughs> Yeah, well, that makes sense. I mean, because I mean, the outfitter, um, although we love them, um, it, yeah. it could have a resonate incorrectly on your show. Yeah, and I'm not. Yeah, I'm nothing against outfitters because I mean they have their purpose and they they do very well with what they do. But at the same time, our perception for our show is we don't want it to look like, you know, we just show we just showed up to this place. He has this deer on camera. We're gonna get in the tree tonight and then we're gonna shoot him. Right. Was, yeah. You gotcha. Get the, you get the, Gotcha. So, so this is an all year round job. You're, you're constantly, you're never really done. Um, you're just kind of creating the, the path for the next show. Um, starts by picking up the phone and finding a new place to hunt, a new, a new person to talk to about where to hunt, what to hunt, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's also about doing our own homework on properties that we lease, um, and have leased for years in the past and really telling a story about a certain animal or our experiences on that, that particular farm or, or whatever. Gotcha. It, did you, how did you learn to tell the story? I mean, that's one of the things that we like to do here too. We like to tell stories mm-hmm. and that's the premise of the whole show is to tell stories. Where did you develop your storytelling skills? Um, it's kind of evolved in the beginning. You know, we just picked up the camera and we would just basically film really just a kill shot or something like that. And then, um, seeing our producer, Trevor, seeing some of the stuff he was putting together, um, basically he was just doing wakeboarding and skateboarding stuff. That was kind of where we, we, we saw our niche in all of this was telling our story through the lens and through the production. And so that's when we got together with him. He taught us some of the stuff that we know. And then we really just researched all sorts of camera techniques and taught, we were, we're completely self-taught. So we, we figured out how to run a camera on full manual settings all on our own and all that stuff, and then we basically all just collaborated on how we were gonna how we were gonna do this and how we were going to tell the story through the lens. And uh, like I said, it's kind of just been an evolving process each year. We've gotten better at it. Gotcha. Just trying to get better and better each year as you go. How did yeah. you? Yeah. Go ahead. How did you guys end up on the Outdoor Channel? Uh, we we were on um, initially a couple different networks. It was. Uh, before Sportsman's was even around, we were on uh, Pursuit, or I'm sorry, Man, Man or Men's Outdoor Network. They all kind of changed a little bit our first couple seasons. Yep. Um, and then Sportsman's Channel came around, and we aired on Sportsman's Channel for a couple of years. And then uh, we finally, a couple of years ago, uh, decided to make the switch to Outdoor Channel. Um, and Sportsman's Channel has grown tremendously, done a bunch of great things. Uh, but Outdoor Channel still is the, the, the premium sports net, or outdoor network, and it's kind of the place to be. And, you know, we decided that it was time to make make the move over there. So, um, you know, it's in more household. It's, it's a bigger network. It's got, you know, some of the better names in the industry, bigger shows. Um, so I think it's just a, a better fit for us. And it's been great ever since we made the move. That's excellent. And pretty much going to plan on staying right there at the Outdoor Channel? Yeah. I mean, 
you never know what the future might hold, but uh, uh, things are going good for us now. We've got a good relationship with everybody at the network and uh, can't complain about anything. Gotcha. Dusty, what other questions do you have for Sean and Michael? I'm putting out a loaded question, and All right. be ready for it. Who's going to shoot the first buck this year, this season? Hopefully, Sean or Nate, they're, they're going on the first hunt. So. Yeah, we're, uh, Nate and I will both be in Utah for, for eight days hunting mule deer. And I did it last year, and I never, I was out there for eight days hiking around in the mountains, and I never even, never even got a shot. It's, it's a very, very tough hunt. But, um, yeah, I would hope Nate or I. Uh, and then, then I go to North Dakota, and Mike's going to film me there. So if, I'll be hunting probably a total of like 15 to 16 days before Mike is able to pick up his bow. So I would hope it would be me, but there's never. <laughs> There's okay. never any guarantee. Who's the yeah, yeah. Who's the best deer hunter out of the crew? Ooh, loaded, loaded. Oh, that, that's a hard one there. You crack. Definitely, sure. definitely. You crack. Clay. Clay. Uh, it, you'll, you'll, it's funny. We're all we're all good at, at bow hunting and deer hunting, obviously, and you'll see a lot of it is luck that plays into it. And they all like to give me trouble and say that I'm the luckiest hunter on the world on the planet. So <laughs> maybe you're just uh, the best one. Maybe maybe I'm just the best. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. What else you got, Dusty? Hey, is Nate really on the boat with you? Yeah, yeah, he is. Uh, can, can you give him the phone for a minute? We at least got to say hi to Nate. Okay, I'll let you say hi to him. Hold on. All right. <laughs> he said, oh, boy. Hello. Nate. Hey, what's going on? Hey, welcome to Big Buck Race, your Big Buck Podcast. Hey, real quick, man, we, we just had to have you on. I can't have you on the boat there netting his fish and not get on the big buck race your big buck podcast real quick give, <laughs> give us give us your number one favorite hunt uh my number one favorite hunt from my from my lifetime or just what i like to do the most uh, no your, your your most memorable hunt let's yours lifetime lifetime Oof. um boy i don't know uh well back before oh. i uh back before i was um hunting much with mike and sean uh, um, I knew Mike at this point, but we didn't hunt together much. And, uh, uh, we had had, we have permission on some areas, some spots that are pretty close to each other. In fact, they're just right across the road. Um, and, uh, and Mike and Sean had had trail cam pictures of a deer that had stayed on their side of the road all summer. And then, uh, in November, I ended up killing them, but it had left their side of the road and came over. There's a bunch of does over where I hunt, <laughs> uh, came over to take some does. Ended up, it's, it's the biggest deer I've killed in my uh, career so far. He was 173, so he was pretty special. Gotcha. Uh, and it was pretty funny because they ended up uh, thinking that I had poached the deer, and we had, we had a big debate about it, actually. Uh, this, is a, this is a long time ago. <laughs> so this this uh, is posing the classic question, why did the buck cross the road? Uh, yeah, right? for, the ladies, for, for the ladies, which is what they always do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, you know. Uh, a buck, a buck chasing ladies will definitely get himself in some major, major trouble. Yep. The answer is yeah. to get to Nate's tree stand. That's why. Yeah. Oh yeah, that wish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that happened more often. Right. So, right. so that, so, so they accused you of being a poacher in the beginning. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, Nate, yeah, John. You didn't. You failed to mention it. You didn't. You didn't tell us you hunted close by. Well, that's true too. Yeah. All we knew, all we had seen was a picture of the deer on our trail cameras all the time, and then bam. Here's a deer with Nate, and we're like, wait a minute, what, what is going on here? And you know, we we asked him where he asked him where he shot it, and he was like, well, on a place where I have permission. And we're like, well, where's that? <laughs> yeah. And little did we know, we didn't realize it was pretty much yeah, right across the road. So so yeah. Nate, you you kind of let him like take care of it, get him all fattened up for a season, <laughs> and you then you pulled the trigger. <laughs> uh, no doubt, yeah. Yeah, right on. Yeah. You know, I, I've been trying to do the same thing to the guys that hunt across the road from me too. So don't feel bad. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, Nate, who's yeah. who's the best deer hunter out of the whole crew? Is loaded. Who's the best deer hunter out of the crew? Well, besides myself, of course, I would probably say. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'd say uh, Mike got him figured out pretty well, especially if, his, if he's at his if he's at home, he can put him down for sure. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, hey, thanks. Thanks, Nate. <laughs> yeah, hey, sorry, Sean. Yeah, <laughs> Sean, good too. <laughs> and, so uh, we're also we're also learning. Uh, you know, none of us are uh, professionals at, uh, on that end of it, or we don't claim to know every every trick in the book. But uh, we're still learning, and we what's good about being in this group um, is that we all learn from each other too. So that's nice too. No, that's awesome. Very cool. So you guys are on the Outdoor Channel. What are, what times do you guys air? Uh, in slot is on Monday nights at eight thirty 
p.m. Um, Tuesday I, at uh, 12 a.m.? Yep. Yeah. So, Eastern? Yeah, 11 Central. Yep, 11 Central. And Mike, are you on there? No, he's not. Oh, I don't I don't even know what our third air time is. I That's, should know what's, this. What's the third air time? I think it's Saturday at 10 p.m. Eastern time. Saturday at 10? Yep. That's right, yep. <laughs> Mike what? didn't know either. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, what 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 other networks, uh, social media, can they reach out to? Can our listeners check you guys out at? You can find us on Twitter. Um, in our what is like, what is I don't even know what it's called. Username, whatever you call it. Uh, your handle, teammate. your Twitter handle. It's Twitter handle. I'm sorry. There you go. <laughs> uh, Team HPTV, and then our username on Instagram is Heartland Bowhunter, all one word. Got it. And how about Facebook? Oh, Facebook. Just Heartland Bowhunter Television. Heartland Bowhunter. Just type one of the two in and you'll find us. Gotcha. Very cool. Awesome. And you have a kick kick butt uh, website, too, at heartlandbowhunter.com. And that has all yep. your links on all of it. So that's great. Yep. You'll find everything about our team, our air times, which I need to look at, and uh, <laughs> our uh, our crew. Right. It is funny. Uh, you, sometimes you forget, you know, you're out there doing your thing. And the last well, thing yeah, was, when the heck are we on TV? <laughs> Yeah, quarter to quarter, so I, I don't know. I don't want to say something that I'm not for sure on. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's what's cool, though. You know, we're talking to you guys. You know, obviously, Michael and Nate's out on the boat, kind of jealous over here. But, you know, you, you, you guys are you're real guys. You're down to earth, and, you know, you cut up with each other and have a lot of fun. And, and that means a lot to us. And, you know, our listeners really appreciate you guys joining us up and, yeah. and uh, taking oh. time out of your out of your day to, to get in touch with us. Before we let you go, let's, yeah. let's talk about that mini series you got coming up. Mm-hmm. What's that all about? Um, basically, Carbon TV came to us and asked us if we were interested in something similar to Full Strut that we had going on during the spring, except in the fall. So they asked us if we had um, any extra whitetail footage from last fall that we didn't use on the Outdoor Channel and were willing to make into uh, a mini series, and we most certainly did. We have a few uh, whitetail hunts that. It took place in the Midwest that just that we didn't actually even have room for on uh, Heartland Bowhunter on the Outdoor Channel. So we're just going to make a mini series. I think the episodes will run for six to eight minutes, and we'll have six originals um, that will start sometime in October. I'm not sure if we've set an exact date yet, but look for that. Uh, I would assume early October to run into November. Gotcha. Very cool, man. Well, we do appreciate you coming on the show with us and and sharing a little more inside scoop about what you are and how you do it and all that kind of good stuff and uh we wish you luck this fall and keep up the great work and the the videography it's fantastic thank you guys for having us on it's a, definitely a privilege i wasn't i wasn't completely aware of what you guys were doing but once i did some investigating i see you guys have a very large following so i'm very privileged to be on here and I appreciate everything you guys have done for us and look forward to uh, hopefully talking to you guys again. Oh, yeah. You know, awesome, guys. Hey, do me a favor, if you would, and give Allison a shout-out and tell her thanks for getting us hooked up. Yeah, you know? Allison. I'm sorry. Yeah, she 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 uh she's an awesome gal and and you know she's uh she definitely keeps in touch with us and and when she finds somebody that she, she knows would be uh, an awesome guest on the podcast we you know she she looks you up and and gets you in touch with the right people and you know I'm fortunate that Allison got me and you in touch Sean and and you know we're here on the podcast tonight and and join herself and see what's going on with Heartland Bowhunter and you know it sounds like you guys got an awesome program going and shout out to Allison yeah thanks a lot Allison she uh she hooked us up together, and she's even offered to have me down on a hunt in Kentucky. She's been very generous, and seems like a pretty good gal. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, if you guys ever get up in New, uh, Ohio, let me know, and you're welcome to stay at my place, and I can put you in tree stand up this way. Yeah, definitely check his references, though. Always check on Dusty's references. I, I, <laughs> I've been hunting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, uh, you know, it, it's. Uh, Ohio's a good state. You know, a lot of states are popping up for some nice bucks. And, you know, I've been fortunate to be in some good areas with some nice whitetail. And, you know, my, my harvest wall hangers are pretty nice here. And like I said, it's uh, always open invitation to you guys. You're welcome to stay. I got beds in the basement. You're welcome to use them. Hey, I, I looked into my references, and well, you were my reference, and you sent me some nice bucks, so I might, uh, I might take you up on that. <laughs> yeah, let me let's set, get with me, and we'll set a date, and uh, November fifteenth through the thirtieth, it's rocking here for the rut. So, all right, sounds Very good, cool. fellas. Well, thanks, Sean. Thanks, Michael. And hold on just re real tight after we end the recording. i got one more thing I want you to do. Hey, thanks, Nate, too. We can't forget about oh, Nate. Oh, yeah. And thanks, Nate, if he's listening. 
That's right. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Hey, yeah. hey, Nate, hey, Nate. Next time you, he says go, uh, Michael says go dip net that for me. Just knock it off the hook. There you go. <laughs> We're on a team now. That'd be a terrible move. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, right. I, I thought, I, thought maybe, I thought maybe just out there having you dip net fish for him. <laughs> and uh, it's usually the other way around, anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> right on, guys. Thanks a lot. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. All right. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us, Sean and Michael from Heartland Bowhunter. That was fantastic. Learned. Yeah, I'm going to shout out to Nate. You forget about Nate. I do I do forget about Nate. But Nate was kind of like this last-minute entry into the show. Hey, he wasn't even on our, the guest hey, list. We still got to shout out to Nate, though. I mean, he was there with us, right? Yeah, I like a little structure in my life. You know? Yeah, right. You know, Sean, Michael, Nate, Heartland Bowhunter. What an awesome group of guys. Nate you know? crashed the party, man. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's all right. I like Nate. They're all good yeah. guys, all of them. No, it was pretty cool. I, I don't think we've ever interviewed somebody that was fishing for bass on a boat before. Right, you know, and that just something unique that another thing that Heartland puts out there, right. you know. He he was actually on the boat fishing a tournament and was was willing to join us on the podcast. How cool is that? That was awesome. So let me let me just redo this real quick. Thank you to Sean, Michael, and Nate for joining right. us on the Big Buck Registry's <laughs> Big Buck Podcast. See, now that's official. That's official, you know. And, you know, we, we thank you for joining us and we love what you're doing on the outdoor channel you know you guys are spitting out some awesome footage and shout out to the whole crew there at heartland yes. Hunt. and shout out to allison roberts onan yeah absolutely allison thank you thank you thank you we can't uh you know some of these great guests can't be made contact with without some other contacts besides the jay and myself absolutely it's all about the connections we can create in the community in our in the hunting industry by you know, knowing somebody and and just uh, helping each other out along the way that's what it's all about yeah absolutely you know it's, it's been it's been fun and uh, heartland bowhunter's got some great things up and coming absolutely it's like the american way I, in a sense i almost wish i lived in about 1970 because there wasn't so much to do in life back then right you could sit around and play the guitar for a couple hours right your your entertainment was not facebook or tv or uh, the internet or smartphones. It was pick up a book, go play a sport or go play an instrument. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, uh, man, it just, nowadays it seems like it's never ending. Like life is just so fast. Days fly by. You're so busy. There's no time to sit down and, and pick a banjo or a strum a guitar, but you got to make time. You got to slow life down and, right. and do things for yourself sometimes, you know, right. not being selfish, but there is more to life than just go, go, go. Yes, and I think it's healthier, and I think you'll live longer if you take some time to just to go out and enjoy the slower aspects of life, like hunting and fishing. Right, yeah, absolutely, you know, and man, it, life is flying by, but you you get in a tree stand, it's going to slow down, so that I look forward to whitetail season coming upon us here soon. And uh, Jay, shout out to Allison and Nan. Man, thank you very much, Allison, for what you do for us, and we appreciate that. Yes, very much so. All right, Dusty, how can we reach you over at Chubby Tines? Oh, we got to do the Chubby Tines Outdoors Tip of the Week. Tip of the Week. Chubby Tines Outdoors Tip of the Week. I'm going with this week to uh, not take brand new camouflage in the woods. Okay, why not? Man, it's got a little bit of a glisten to a shine. Really? I, I, think, I, I think camouflage needs to be washed quite a few times before it goes to the woods all right hold on what's worst you mean well washed yeah you <laughs> tell you from the east coast <laughs> all right what what is somebody from ohio called this a isn't buckeye. a joke i'm a buckeye okay yeah all right so worst is a buckeye kind of thing yeah sorry got it that's all right i just trying to make sure i understand what you're doing I'll make make buckeye. sure you point out my flaws that's not a flaw that's not a flaw, but yeah, I, I, it's like I an think, interpretation. I just want to make sure I'm interpreting what you're doing because if worst is something other than washed, I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. But anyway, you right. know that might be a little bit of the hunt net coming out of me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, continue on with the chubby times tip of the week. Yeah, this this uh, make sure that uh, the camouflage makes it through the washing machine cycle several times you know just just to take the glisten of the new shine off of it 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 may it may take your hunt to the next level if they they can't pick you out of the tree stand Mm, i like that that's a very good one because it does come in kind of shiny and i bet if you did a microscopic check on it you see all kinds of like glistening particles in there that aren't supposed to be there yeah you know i think it's just a more or less an appearance on the shelf type thing Mm -hmm. that comes out in the washing machine 
Uh, you know, I, most people will agree with that, I think. Right. Uh, Probably a sales technique to make you buy them. Yeah, it, it looks nice, but that, that nice look is not always appealing to the deer when you're in a tree stand. You just don't want to get busted sitting in, a tree, in the stand with brand new camouflage on. Yep, very cool. All right, so how do we check that out? How do we how do we check out Chubby Tines Outdoors? Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors, and you can always reach me at Dusty Huntnick. Dusty Huntnick. Nice. The uncensored version of Dusty Phillips. I like it. Jay, how can the folks reach you at the Big Buck Registry? Okay. So in order to submit a photo to the Big Buck Registry for the Big Buck Registry's Hall of Fame, Wall of Fame, um, what you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck. And all the instructions are right there. Just words words of wisdom here. Make sure you send in a picture that's you and the buck. You can send in other pictures, but as so long as you have a picture of you and the buck, I need the state of harvest. I need the hunter's first name. And if you send that in, pretty much no matter how you send it, whether it's by email, whether it's by the upload feature on that web on that link, or if you somehow can't figure it out and you give up and you decide you're just going to send it in through Facebook, we'll get to those. But it has to be a private message because we're generally not checking the main public board. In order to get on to these mainstream Big Buck Registry, you got to go to the bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck. That's the best way. you got to get on the five buck menu. The five buck menu, five bucks a day. That's what we're doing. Starts at 7 a.m., ends at 9 p.m. And if you'd like to leave some feedback for the show, you could give us a call at 724-613-2825. And feedback or just call in a story, whatever, if you want to connect, if you want to be on the show, you can definitely give us a call there. And uh, see Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. And Twitter is twitter.com forward slash Big Buck Registry iTunes. Now, if you want to listen to the show and some of the I, the directories, you have two choices. Depends on if you want to check it out on computer or a smartphone. If you're on an iPhone or any iDevice or on iTunes on any computer, um, it's bigbuckregistry.com forward slash iTunes, and that'll just bring up your iTunes account. If you want to check us out on Stitcher because you're on a different device or it will still work on a Apple device, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Stitcher. You can check out the stitcher there or go to itunes either one works and if you do go to itunes just subscribe and leave us a five-star review if you don't mind i think that's it dusty awesome it is awesome i'm jay scott i'm dusty phillips and this is the big buck registry's big buck podcast see you next week can't wait 